anyone is interested in the Korean Peninsula, then you know over the past several weeks and certainly continuing as far as we can see in the immediate future that there is a lot going on both in North and South Korea that have tremendous effects not just on those two countries but other countries in the region and the United States as well. And just to give you a couple of examples here, in South Korea yesterday, we're still waiting for these uh, election results to come in, but the National Assembly in South Korea had its elections yesterday, which again is going, the outcome of that, uh, depending on which of the two major parties win, uh, could have uh, very definite effects on the implementation of the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement, as an example. South Korea is going to have a presidential election in December. The, according to the South Korean Constitution, the incumbent cannot succeed himself or herself, so we know there's going to be a new president in South Korea uh, at the end of this year. And so what effects that has uh, in Korea, on the Korean Peninsula, and uh, across the world is another thing that will be certainly very interesting to pursue. And then probably something that you're even more familiar with is the developments in North Korea over the last five to six weeks, first in which North Korea appeared to agree with the United States to suspend its uh, highly enriched uranium program, its plutonium program, its missile, long-range missile testing program, and to allow the IAEA inspectors back into the country where they had not been for three years. In return for that, the United States promised to provide 240,000 metric tons of food assistance. So that looked very good, and that was just at the end of February uh, this year. And then since that time, though, the North Koreans have announced that they are going to conduct the launching of a weather satellite, which would appear to violate uh, various United Nations Security Council resolutions and most definitely, if they do that, is going to torpor torpedo the agreement between the United States and, and North Korea negotiated just uh, a few weeks ago. So those are just some of the events that are going on in Korea that I think have helped to attract the crowd that is here uh, today. And to help us understand more about these very, very important issues, we are extremely uh, fortunate to have two panelists today. The first uh, person that I want to uh, introduce is Ambassador Jack Pritchard. He is the president of the Korea Economic Institute in Washington, D.C. Those of you who have been a member of the council for a few years will, will remember that Jack came out here and addressed our council in 2006, very shortly after he uh, authored Failed Diplomacy, was, which is a book, uh, an excellent book, that I recommend to you, that looked at the nuclear negotiations uh, early in the Bush administration between North Korea and the United States and some of the problems that developed in that negotiation process. Jack is, uh, in addition to his 28 years of service in the United States uh, Army, when he retired, then he switched to the National Security uh, Council and he was ambassador to the Korean Economic Development Organization. I know Spence Richardson is here in the audience who also was involved with that. Uh, that was an effort to try and, again, resolve the nuclear weapons uh, issue in North uh, Korea. So we're very thrilled to have Ambassador Pritchard back with us again uh, today. Our second panelist is Jun Sung Lim. He is the first secretary in the Republic of Korea Embassy in Washington, D.C. And as you're going to see very quickly, he is an expert on trade issues between the United States and South Korea. And he's going to go into some detail about how that free trade agreement, which was just uh, finalized, uh, ratified in the two legislatures at the end of 2011, and the implementation process just began in March of this year. But he is going to give us some uh, best guesses and as well as some specific information about 
how that free trade agreement is going to influence the relationship, not only the trade relationship between our two countries, but the broader relationship too, and more specifically, how it could affect business opportunities in the state of Colorado. If you allow me, uh, let me take the microphone out uh, in order to give you uh, some explanation in a more uh, free way, because it's a uh, not very interesting issue, the trade issues, I, I will give you many statistics, but I, I will try to make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Bill, for your kind introduction, and thank you, President Foesta. Uh, thank you, everybody, of World Affairs Council of Colorado Springs. It's a great privilege and honor to be with you today. I really enjoyed uh, the sceneries. Unfortunately, today I couldn't see the bike <laughs> skies uh, yet, but I hope to see it soon. And it's such a beautiful hotel you uh, introduced us today. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm. Uh, really happy to be this rocky mountain empire. Yesterday I visited uh, the Denver Post, it says, welcome to the Rocky Mountain Empire. Um, the Colorado State, uh, always I've, I have dreamt to visit some someday uh, because my wife had some time to study in Pueblo, uh, Univers University of Colorado in Pueblo like 20 years ago. Um, and then we uh, studied the Fletcher School uh, in Boston. Then uh, I worked in uh, Brussels of Belgium, and then I moved to Beirut of Lebanon. Actually, uh, those three places, now I'm in Washington, D.C. Uh, three places are beautiful places, but uh, whenever we say it's beautiful, she said, no, it's not comparable to Colorado. So she always said that. So um, I would like to see uh, uh, the places in my, in my eyes. But I didn't bring my wife uh, this time because she uh, dated with Japanese guy there <laughs> at the time. You know, you know uh, the, the rivalry between Korea and Japan uh, I can explain uh, to give you a sense. It's like um, the cheerleader of tigers are dating with uh, pioneers. <laughs> so um, it's uh, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, but but it, I mean, you know, it's joke. I because. <laughs> uh, because the schedule is too tight uh, yesterday and today. So I, I, I couldn't bring, bring her to the best. Next time, definitely I will bring her to this beautiful state. Today, um, uh, I would like to introduce very briefly the general um, description of the Korea-US FTA. It's a free trade agreement. Uh, for some of you, it may not be that familiar word. Uh, free trade agreement is a uh, commitment of two countries to reduce barriers for the trade. Uh, let me start with uh, the first one. Uh, Korea-US FTA, we call it Chorus FTA. Chorus now in full effect from March 15th. Over 80% of US exports to Korea now duty-free. So they don't pay, have to tariffs when they enter the Korean market. Um, it took a very long time uh, to get in force because of political situation in both countries. Um, there were quite uh, some perceptions in uh, both countries. Uh, still, there are. Uh, some people say trade uh, may take out their jobs, uh, especially with the developing countries. But I could say uh, through this FTA, uh, you will see the big market of Korea. We have 50 million population. And also, not just population, we have those kind of uh, high rates of education, as President Obama always say about that. 
and we have unemployment rate and highly unionized. That means we have a very strong labor protection. And uh, our GDP per capita uh, is matches uh, around uh, 12, uh, 12th rank uh, in the world. And also US-Korea trade is much balanced comparing with uh, US trade with China, Germany, or Japan. And this is very important thing. Um, from 2006, the investment from Korea surpassed the investment from the United States to Korea. So uh, last year in 2011, Korean companies invested into the United States $16.4 billion. Uh, but in, in the other way around, the US companies invested to Korea $2.5 billion. I will go into details about the relationship of the in trade and investment. The general benefits, uh, average tariff rate of Korea now, uh, there are more or less over 10,000 tariff lines. You can say it's items in the world. Do we categorize it for, uh, uh, for tariffs? Uh, average tariff rate of Korea now is 12.1%. Uh, it's very high because of some uh, agricultural goods, but anyhow, we have, for the manufacturing goods, also we have very high rate of uh, tariff. So those 12.1% of tariff will be eliminated. 95 of them will be elimin eliminated in five years, but in the end, it will, it will be gone. For the U.S., they will keep, you will keep 3.5% of tariffs toward the whole countries, but now you will uh, eliminate it um, for some time. Okay. And uh, some politicians say that it's a simple math. So if you eliminate the tariff of 12%, you will increase your export to Korea because it will be cheaper and stronger in competitiveness in Korean market. And uh, the administration of uh, US is saying that it will uh, support um, or create 70,000 uh, US jobs uh, in the United States because of uh, increase of export and expand of economic activities. And other than the tariffs, it has various provisions and items about uh, opening Korean economy toward US companies. The first and foremost important three things are transparency, IPR protection, intellectual property protection, and competition in service sector, pharmaceutical sectors. Financial telecommunications broadcasting, express delivery, oh, it goes very fast. Uh, legal services we open to American services, and it will give level playing field for US businesses. Why we are saying that? The, our F free trade agreement with European unions, the European countries have very similar economic structure with you. They already entered our market last July 1st. So they are taking markets ahead of the United States. But now, thanks to the uh, implementation, American companies in uh, on a, a level playing field. And also, our Korea US FTA uh, is providing a model for future trade agreement. US government is negotiating with uh, eight other trans-Pacific countries. They call it a trans-Pacific a partnership, TPP, another type of uh, multilateral uh, FTA. Uh, they're using our text as a model for uh, their texts. Now, uh, I will spend more time to talk about benefits uh, on, uh, in Colorado. Uh, you will, uh, I, will, I distributed a brochure uh, on your table. Uh, we call it uh, Colorado-Korea uh, Connect. Until last year, uh, we traveled around the country to ask your uh, help 
uh, to support our, the passage in the Congress. At the time, we talked about Korea-US partnership. But after the passage and implementation, we changed it into US-Korea Connect. Because we would like to connect both businesses together to find uh, more opp business opportunities. Uh, this brochure is uh, specially uh, made for you to let you know that where are the benefits, where are the business opportunities using, uh, uh, using this FTA. There are, I told you there are 10, more than 10,000 items and uh, the provisions of this FTA is very hard to understand, even for me. So we would like to translate into uh, very tangible uh, items uh, for your business. Uh, we selected uh, several items. Uh, that's top 10 experts to Korea. Uh, normally, uh, Colorado's expert to Korea is around more than $226 million. Around 40% uh, the beef takes uh, the share. Beef industry is really a big business, uh, doing big, good business in Korea. And also, uh, um, other than those food items, Colorado State has very good potential to export and do business uh, in Korea in mach uh, machineries, optical goods, computer equipment, semiconductors, uh, the scrap product, pharmaceutical goods, plastics, metal uh, working machineries, electrical equipment, and components. Those are the top 10 items you are exporting to Korea. What are the benefits then uh, from this FTA? Beef, now we put 40% of tariffs on US beef, Australian beef, Canadian beef as well. Now, uh, the beef, tariff on beef will be eliminated in uh, over 15 years. We put a little bit long because we have our domestic catalysts, but US beef market, uh, no, the imported beef market takes around uh, more than 70% in our market and it's separated from domestic uh, beef. It's diff different kind. Among those 70%, now Australian beef takes more or less 50, a half. And US beef takes 37%. Uh, and Canadian beef, they just started to export to Korea from March. What will happen soon? It will change because we will put the same level of tariffs of 40% to Australian beef and Canadian beef because we don't have FTAs with them. But American beef will face Rather than 40%, they will face 37.3% this year already. But next year, 2.7% will go down. Every year during uh, the next over 15 years, uh, it will be reduced. And every year, there will be a price gap, competitiveness gap with Australian and Canadian beef. So that will change the market share, I'm, I'm sure. And part for cinema projectors, um, it, now we put 8% of tariffs, it, it already it's gone. Uh, plastic plates and sheets, 6.5%, it's gone. Whole highs and skin, 3%, uh, medical devices, 8%, parts and electrical machines, apparatus. These are the items, um, if you have business in that field, you can export it. Uh, with uh, more competitiveness. Yesterday, I spent whole one day to meet uh, businesses in Colorado, Denver. I met several, uh, several uh, businesses to have one-on-one -on -one meetings and group meetings together to explain them what are their benefits. They asked me, uh, they showed me their product, the actual, actually the code, then I get back to them with the tariff rates before the FTA and after the FTA. I will show you some examples because uh, seeing those uh, statistics and those categories are not very uh, familiar with us. Uh, I, I showed the example of beef, but I want to show one example of 
Uh, there is a company in Denver, Reynold Polymer. I don't know if, if you're familiar with this company. They are producing and exporting aquarium equipment. It's an ac acrylic panel, big panel and very thick. They are the to world top producer of that acrylic uh, aquarium because that uh, acrylic panel should stand for the pressure from the water. You see that if you go to Orlando, there's huge one uh, 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 aquarium. It, it contains a real like a sea or lake. And uh, they are exporting those uh, panels to Korea uh, in, in cooperation with uh, Korean companies to build amusement park like or Orlando. And they have faced 8% of tariffs uh, on their product. Now it's gone. Uh, so they, they were very happy to uh, know that. But instead of uh, lowering their price of 8%, they, they hope to maintain their original price. And then rather than uh, give that 8% of margin, extra margin, to give local distributors then they will use that uh, extra margin to advertise and expanding their markets. That's the good thing uh, for US businesses. They have extra miles to go, uh, abilities to go. That's the intention of uh, this FTA. Uh, the reason why I'm here to speak about this FTA, benefits of this FTA, is to draw your attention to Korea market. There are opportunities, there are benefits uh, of your product or your neighbor business' product. Um, so uh, if you have, if you are doing business or if you know anybody who do business and would like to find benefits of this FTA, please sh uh, let them know our website address. I put the website address uh, in the brochure and there is a QR code if you uh, scan with your mobile phone uh, it will guide you to our system to let them know what are their products. Uh, they need to know, and if they cannot find it in our website, then they can send me email, and there is a, uh, several uh, buttons. If they click it, they, they will guide them to send us email. We will let them know. Um, and also, there are benefits for Korean companies to export to the United States. Especially there are some items we are exporting to Colorado. Uh, the garment, uh, iron steel articles, organic chemicals, you know, tubes, dry machines. Um, I met uh, some people who are importing from Korea some uh, laundry shops, the goods for laundry shops. Actually, some of them are about laundry shops. They will have more competitiveness uh, to do business with Korea because they have a lower price or better margin, a bigger margin with them. Um, I would like to explain a little bit what, what Korea, Korea's FTA means to Korea. Uh, we will have very big, we will see uh, better access to the world's biggest market, United States. That's the most, uh, four most benefits for us. And it's a competitive market. So if Korean companies are successful in the United States, they know that they can, they can compete any, any other companies in the world. Um, and also it's a reform package. As I, saw, it, as, as I told you, we uh, reformed our domestic economic system uh, using this FTA. So we, uh, after, after, after we, uh, throughout this process, we believe we will have more competitiveness, better competitiveness afterwards. And also we, uh, we can have reinforced Korea-US alliance and partnership. I would like to uh, talk about a little bit about uh, export trade and investment. If you export $100, some say uh, the other party will lose $100. If you import $100, some say uh, they will gain $100. But I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with this idea. 
export, import will gain, uh, will give gains for you. For example, if uh, US companies export $100 more, thanks to this FTA, they will find more market opportunity in Korea. If they export more and more, what do they do in the future? They will invest because they want to be with the market always. If you import $100 from Korea, if Korean companies export more and more, then they will invest into the United States. That's what I showed you that Korean companies uh, last year, they uh, invested more than $16 billion because they would like to be with the market. Trade relationship, enhanced trade relationship, then enhanced uh, investment relationship will lead to better relationship overall between the two countries. The logic behind of this FTA, starting this FTA with the United States, uh, up, up to 2003, United States was the first largest trading partner for Korea. Next year, it became second after China. Next year, it became third next to European unions. Next year, it became fourth. Now, United States is fourth next to Japan. United States is a special country for Korea. I see uh, many people from, uh, from the military today. In 2000, uh, 1950, we had a war with North Korea. Uh, in that war, throughout the course of the period, 305 Colorado uh, people, soldiers from Colorado sacrificed uh, their lives for the country they've never heard of, they've never had any idea about it. And after the war, the uh, whole economy of Korea was devastated. And you helped us to rebuild our, uh, our economy. You helped us, uh, you let us know how to make products. You let us know how to export those products. And we became 12th largest economy in the world. And, but we saw that the declining presence of United States in Korea, uh, in our economic relationship. So both governments decided to uh, enhance our relationship. So we decided to have it. So trade relationship, investment relationship, and afterwards the whole enhanced relationship is the objective of this FTA. In order to do that, we would like to invite you to know what are the benefits of this FTA for your business. If you find more business opportunities, that will help the relationship of two countries. Yeah, that's, that's why I put it's a, uh, this FTA's objective is the partnership. Yeah, it, it's, it's the uh, support of the Coast FTA in the Congress. Uh, thanks to your support, um, two senators uh, from Colorado and uh, seven House of Representatives supported uh, this FTA. I really appreciate uh, your support. So uh, once again, I would like to tell you uskoreaconnect.org. Uh, we do this job because I, some, some Koreans say, why are you promoting US exports to Korea uh, rather than promoting importing from Korea, I already explained to you. This will lead to uh, your business. And also I encourage you uh, at the same time to import, then will, it will lead to get investment more from Korea. So um, uh, please, if you have any questions, uh, any comment, uh, please uh, visit our website and uh, leave your comment and leave your questions. Thanks very much. You don't know how loud I talk. <laughs> Good. 
Well, Sky, thank you very much uh, to you and, and uh, Dr. Magician, Bill Perry. I, I don't know how he did it in terms of lining up uh, a program on Korea, but just think about this. Uh, uh, he had to know in advance that the Korean National Assembly election would be very close and we'd all be interested in it. Uh, he had to know well in advance that the United States and North Korea would end uh, the isolationist period among them. Uh, there would be a, a series of meetings that would lead to a February 29th, as he mentioned, agreement that the North Koreans would then uh, announce a launch, and that launch could happen as early as today. Uh, I, I don't know what kind of connections he has with North Korea, but uh, <laughs> you've done a wonderful job of piquing everybody's interest. Uh, and so I'm, glad, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, so my first job is to report the uh, results of the Korean National Assembly election. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, my staff back is, uh, in, in Washington has sent me a couple of emails. As you know, the time difference uh, is such that uh, uh, it's hard to find out uh, complete uh, election results uh, very rapidly. But I want to give them to you, and then I want to tell you what the significance of them is. It looks as though that the current majority party has retained its majority. Uh, there's 300 seats in the National Assembly. It looks as though that the majority party is now going to have 152. A bare uh, majority, but a majority nonetheless. Uh, the composition of where they won and how they won, you know, it's, it's interesting, but I just want to pause for a second and talk about how they have um, uh, achieved this. You know, a year ago, uh, my organization sponsored a group of National Assembly members into Washington that we had them for a week. All the talk among themselves and in the press was how badly the current uh, majority party was going to lose. There, absolutely, there was no doubt about it. Um, and in recent months, the majority party uh, has, has essentially said, uh, how can we get back the trust of the Korean people? And, and they've got uh, essentially a leader, uh, the former, not former, the daughter of a former uh, uh, president of Korea, uh, Park Gane. Park Gane. Uh, she said, let's change the name of the party. Everybody will forget well, all the things they didn't like about us. You know, and everybody made fun of that. Well, I, you know, I kind of think it worked. Uh, so what are the significance now uh, of, of what's going on here? Uh, as Bill mentioned, you have a presidential election uh, uh, that's coming up in December. Uh, and in Korean politics, there tends to be a, if you're in the majority, you may not become the, the, the president. Uh, however, I, I'm not so sure this time around because the, the leader of the current majority that retained the majority uh, appears to be very popular and she is going to be a presidential candidate. She came very close to being the nominee of her party uh, five years ago. So I would say to you, uh, as you're watching events in Korea, uh, pay attention in December uh, to the election. Uh, Korea very well could have its first uh, female president uh, and if so, it would come back to what we've seen uh, emerge uh, uh, today. Uh, that's uh, number one. Number two, let's talk just a little bit about the U.S.-Korea relationship uh, and why it is being described as the best it has ever been. And that's a, that's a pretty big statement to make. Uh, I, for one, believe in the power of symmetry, meaning the relationship between leaders. Uh, I, I watched it uh, in previous, previous life, uh, watching the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, the Japanese have had only a two or three times in their recent history where their prime minister was able to stay in power two, three, uh, and in one case, five years. And each of those cases, the relationship with the United States blossomed. Uh, the most recent was the five-year overlap uh, between uh, George Bush and Prime Minister Koizumi. Uh, and, and so I began paying attention to this. Um, and what I have seen is a deliberate decision on the part of the Korean President, Lee Myung-bak. He had a one-year overlap with President Bush. 
there was concerns at that time that two conservative presidents who got along well for that one year, it would not spill over into uh, the next relationship between President Barack Obama and President Lee myung Bak. Uh, but President Lee, I, I think very astutely, decided that he was going to initiate um, a close relationship uh, with President Barack Obama. Uh, and to his credit and to the credit of both leaders, uh, it has developed into one of the very best in terms of leader-to-leader -leader relationships. It has resulted in a Korea that is a global partner of the United States. Now, uh, what's the significance of that? Well, over the very recent years, we've seen the description of Korea to go from its focus on the peninsula to its focus on the region. Now it is a very much focused on the global issues and has been a, an outstanding partner of the United States. We've seen that in, uh, in and I, I said earlier in an interview, uh, um, awarding or rewarding, and that's not the case, but uh, President Obama very much wanted to see uh, Seoul in the limelight, and that resulted in Seoul uh, hosting the G20 conference uh, in Seoul in uh, 2010, and just, uh, um, uh, just several weeks ago, uh, a successful hosting of the 2012 Nuclear Security Summit. Uh, those are just remarkable things when you consider the size of the country and what their impact has been on the global scale. It is increasing, the trend is upward. Uh, so why are we concerned? Well, we've got, as Bill said, um, a presidential election in Korea in December. We have our own presidential election in, um, in November. There is no guarantee of what that match will look like. We had at the top of the tickets uh, most recently a very uh, progressive Korean president and a very conservative U.S. president, uh, and that didn't work well. Uh, the underlying relationship was absolutely rock solid, uh, but at the top, uh, we all have seen the headlines of how that turned out. Uh, so it does matter, and it matters in the future direction of uh, the relationship. I, for one, believe that it will turn out just fine. Well, let me now, and, and, and let me explain briefly, I think you may have all uh, understood that originally we had three people on the panel. Uh, we normally try to bring in a person from the State Department's Korea desk. But at the last moment, he was pulled off because of the impending launch of this satellite by North Korea. It is his job on the, on the Korea desk within the State Department to watch these things and have to report on the consequences and significance of them. Uh, so because he's not here, we both get a chance to talk a little bit longer. Uh, so I'm going to cover uh, a few of the things that he might uh, have covered. And, but I do want to talk now about what I believe to be uh, the most important things in the headlines that you've been seeing and what those consequences are and why we're watching this uh, uh, happen. Uh, that is, first and foremost, we're anticipating a launch of a space uh, vehicle uh, with a satellite on top of it by the North Koreans at point any time. Uh, they created a window, uh, that's as you may well know for weather and technical reasons. Uh, the anticipation is in the next couple of days, uh, if the weather improves in North Korea, they will in fact launch this thing. Um, how do we get here and why is it important? Well, let me go back just a little bit with some anecdotal uh, information for you. Uh, as Bill mentioned, I was working at the White House on the National Security Council for five years. Uh, four of those were uh, nominally in uniform. I never wore my uniform. And then after I uh, retired, they hired me back for a fifth year. Uh, but one of the things that we were involved with the North Koreans was trying to get a handle on their nuclear weapons program. And there are two things that I want to bring up uh, here. In the midst of our discussions in 1998, in August of 1998, uh, with the North Koreans on trying to improve our relationship, uh, we got wind that they were about ready to launch a rocket. Uh, we were in New York with uh, uh, Vice Minister Kim Gae-gwan. You know, that's, that's 14 years ago. The guy's 
still is part of the negotiations and the person responsible for negotiating this most recent agreement. Uh, we went to him and, and we laid out all the negative reasons why the international community in the United States uh, would not uh, look favorably uh, upon this. His response, uh, you know, was, well, just, just wait and see. We understand what you're saying. And we came away thinking, okay, he understands the consequences there. Uh, and the next day, they launched the rocket. Uh, uh, and, and so what it taught us very early on is that uh, sometimes the right hand and the left hand in North Korea uh, don't know that they're connected at the shoulders. Uh, in this case, he had no clue, uh, and he was, he was winging that. So that gives rise to did he or did he not know uh, in advance uh, when he was uh, brokering the deal on the 29th of February that the North Koreans were going to launch uh, a satellite. Uh, I would say it's almost immaterial uh, because from a North Korean point of view, they absolutely, now North Korean point of view, absolutely have a sovereign right to space exploration. Now, let me give you just a little bit of background of why they think that way. Uh, in 2006, on the 5th of July, their time, 4th of July, our time, if you were like me, you were, I don't know what I was doing, I was watching something going on, and CNN breaks out, uh, breaks through with the crawl uh, space on the bottom of the TV that says North Korea launches uh, missile, North Korea launches second missile, third missile, fourth missile, fifth, it, it went on, it was seven missiles altogether, only one of which was long range. The United States, United Nations Security Council met uh, and unanimously passed UN Security Council Resolution 1695 condemning the North Koreans. But what's interesting is the language in there and the language that the, both the Russian and the Chinese ambassador used simply saying the North Koreans without prior notification launched this missile, disturbing the peace and tranquility, and, and it went on and on. What the North Koreans read out of that is they had failed to meet the international procedural standards. And so we, we watched with the inauguration of President Obama in January of 2009, information coming out again that the North Koreans were preparing to launch a missile. And we were thinking, how can they do this? Well, they can do it because they believed that they, one, had that sovereign right, just as everyone else did, and that they had learned from the 2006 experience. So they joined the International Space Treaty. They signed the protocols. They made the appropriate public announcements. They filed with the International Civil Aviation Organization in Montreal. We intend to launch. Here's our windows of opportunity. Uh, here are the boxes where the boosters may fall. Uh, so they did everything that they had been criticized for before. And then they launched on the 5th of April, 2009. They were roundly criticized again. Now, in, in response, they say to this unjustified criticism uh, that they detonated a second nuclear device on the 25th of May, 2009, uh, which, as I've told the North Koreans, is nonsense. You know, if you get angry because somebody has slapped your wrist, you don't detonate a nuclear device. That's a decision that was made a long time in advance. It was part of what they had planned to do. Uh, one of the other things I want to briefly talk about, because we want to save time for your questions, those are most important in this type of a presentation. Um, it, our previous denuclearization attempts with North Korea uh, really surrounded their plutonium program. There are two ways. I remember we have high school students here, so put your notes away. I'm not going to tell you how to build a nuclear weapon. Uh, but there are two ways uh, to do this. One is through a plutonium program, and essentially uh, you, you put uh, uh, rods into a nuclear reactor, you run it for about a year, you then can extract those rods and chemically reprocess in extracting uh, plutonium from that, and then you can build a nuclear weapon. The other way is what you're probably more familiar with is what we're watching Iran do, and that's through uh, a, a uranium enrichment program. 
so we had essentially captured, we thought, the North Koreans' plutonium program early on. Um, but we became suspicion, suspicious in 1999, 2000, and by 2002, we were convinced that the North Koreans were working secretly uh, to create a, the other way. They were going to enrich uranium uh, and, uh, clandestinely to create nuclear weapons. So a small group of us went to North Korea to confront them. They denied this. Uh, you know, I won't go through that history, but it's as Ten years ago, we were confronting the North Koreans over highly enriched uranium, for which they absolutely denied. Uh, and then in, in November of 2010, uh, I made my 11th trip to North Korea. Um, I had asked the North Koreans to go to their nuclear facilities. I hadn't been there in a while, uh, for six years. I wanted to go back and take a look, uh, see if how the plutonium program was working. And quite frankly, we were also interested, we saw new construction. They were digging, they were doing something uh, at their nuclear facilities and no one knew what it was. Uh, so I was hoping to be able to get a glimpse of this. Uh, I went um, and uh, in the discussions I had at their nuclear site, they were in the process of telling me what that construction was. It was going to be a 100 megawatt uh, experimental uh, uh, light water reactor. The conversation continued. We were talking about fuel. I'm not quite sure how this developed, but all of a sudden I had a very clear picture of this guy was giving me bits and pieces that suggested that they had a uranium enrichment facility there at Yonbyon. And when I, I said, wait a minute, you know, is, let's, you know, and as we talked about it, he confirmed that. And later on that evening as I was talking to uh, one of the nuclear negotiators at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I, I essentially said, you know, listen, this is what I learned today at your nuclear facilities, and, and I couldn't even get it, the rest of it out. He was stunned. He said, he, they told you what? Uh, you know, I don't think that they intended to do that, but nonetheless, they revealed then, uh, and, and what I was able to do, uh, leaving North Korea, you've got to go back out through China, uh, I knew that Dr. Sig Hecker, who is the former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, he and I first went to Yanbyon in 2004. I called him. He was in Pyongyang, going to follow me by a week into North Korea. Told him everything I had seen and heard and, uh, you know, suggested, as I had told the North Koreans, that he really needed to get in to see that facility. A long story short, he did, and he was stunned by the sophisticated uh, advanced state of what was happening there. And so we've gone from in a, in a eight to 10 year period of absolute denial to absolute proof. Uh, and so what we're concerned now is with their plutonium program somewhat under arrest um, and not going very far, what are they doing with highly enriched uranium? Um, we know that they will, in fact, launch this rocket, but we're also seeing some disturbing news that the North Koreans may be preparing for a third nuclear test, uh, and whether or not that has uh, uh, or uses highly enriched uranium will be of great interest uh, to us uh, there. So you've got a lot of things on your plate as you're thinking about the Korean Peninsula uh, here. You've got the elections that have just occurred and what they may mean, moving towards the Korean presidential elections and what that may mean in concert with our own elections. Uh, you're going to have a, an international negative reaction uh, to the North Koreans' uh, uh, launch of a satellite. But more importantly, I would focus on what happens if they do conduct a third nuclear test. And I say this from an analytical framework. If you had asked me two weeks ago, as people have, and if you dig around, you'll find me on the record someplace saying, do you think that they're going to test a third nuclear weapon? And I'd say no. And that is because there is a distinct difference uh, from a Chinese perspective on a launch of a satellite and a nuclear test. The Chinese were not at all thrilled with the North Koreans on their previous two nuclear detonations. And during this succession period, which I won't go into now, but I encourage you during the Q&A to ask about it, and then I will go into it, because I'll be on your time and not mine. 
Um, uh, but for a Chinese point of view, I would say no. The North Koreans at this point in time have a very fragile transition going on in which their current leader is a 28-year-old. And I'm looking around uh, uh, you know, at all the Air Force officers here, uh, uh, you know, and I see an 06 over here, a colonel. You know, and I myself retired as an 06 in 28 years. I'm not quite sure how you would react if one day, you know, the, the, the president says, hey, oh, by the way, my daughter, who's going to be 28, I'm now going to make her your boss. She's a four-star general. How do you like that? <laughs> Probably not. I think there's going to be some turmoil behind the scenes with the military. Nonetheless, all these things come into the factor that the North Koreans really can't afford uh, to push the Chinese too far. So my answer would have been, no, I don't think so. They're, they're in too fragile a situation the Chinese have, have told them, uh, based upon some previous bad behavior, you know, watch your step. But now it looks as though they might. So what, what are they, what, what's happening? What are the consequences of that? Well, for me, they're not good. It means that the North Koreans have made a calculated estimate of how the Chinese will react and that they, the North Koreans, can get away with it. That the Chinese are in such a delicate position that they will not do anything to push the North Korean regime towards collapse. And the North Koreans are going to take advantage of that. That's not good news. So on that pessimistic note, let me just wrap up my initial comments. And I invite you to challenge what you've heard today. Uh, First Secretary Lim has done a wonderful job of bringing home the importance of the course FTA to Colorado and its importance to the United States-Korea relationship. It makes it much more holistic. We go from a relationship that has been based on for 50, 60 years on our security relationship to one that is a mature partnership with a firm leg based in our economic relationship as well. So thank you very much. Please keep your questions short. We've got 15 minutes. Let's go. Yes, sir. OK, thank you. The first, the first question to Mr. Lim then has to do with Korean exports to Colorado, what some of them might be. And the second question has to do with basically missile defense. Could the United States uh, destroy the rocket launch uh, if it chose to do so, or so, in some combination with the Japanese and the South Koreans? Yes, thank you for uh, the question. Actually, I showed uh, five items. There are, those are five top, among the five top items. Why there are other, other five? Because I showed only there are tariffs. It's the same as the U.S. exports to Korea. Even though um, United States are importing from Korea, the, especially Colorado State, are importing from Korea such as computers, papers, and some machineries. But uh, those items do not have uh, tariffs at this moment. That means there will be no tariff elimination benefits uh, from this FTA. But I showed the, um, some garments, especially women's and girls' knit blouses and shirts. That, that is a top uh, importing item from Korea to Colorado. And there is uh, some art article of iron and steel, organic chemicals, inner tubes on rubber, and drying machines. Um, if you would like to find more importing uh, items, top importing items by state, uh, or the whole uh, United States, if you uh, visit the website, we, we post it in our website. Or if you can, uh, you can ask me to send you those statistics. Thank you. Well, let me just say, um, uh, the technical capability obviously is there. The, the, and you can talk to your Air Force friends that the best way to do that is when the rocket is on the launch pad going up, not when it's coming down or, or you know, there. But, but I think the more important question is, uh, you know, is there a political decision to do that and is that wise? Um, you know, there is a calculation that have to, has to be made and that is, while you may have the technical capability to do it, uh, number one, what happens if you actually miss 
and, and what signal does that send to Japan, Korea, your allies on your own uh, missile defense system? And more importantly, you know, how is the rest of the world going to react when this is an announced uh, peaceful use of a space exploration and not a, a, a missile? Uh, you know, so I, I would just end up saying that I personally doubt very seriously if there is a, uh, uh, a, a discussion that is based on anything other than if there is an errant missile going in the wrong direction that requires the protection by the Japanese, uh, you know, to destroy that thing. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I don't think we'll see that. Next question. Yes, sir. The question is, what advantages do Korean imports into the United States have over comparable imports from other countries? So comparing with other imports from other countries? Yeah. Oh, yes. Actually, um, different from Korea, Korea now has, <clears throat> excuse me, 40, uh, FTAs with 45 countries around the world. Uh, so we have many countries uh, selling their products without duty, without tariffs in the United States. But in the United States, the, uh, the major economies we can say uh, United States has FTA is Mexico and Canada as a NAFTA, Australia, and Chile. Other countries are a little bit smaller economies than Korea. And we don't compete with those countries, especially with Chile. We don't compete. We don't export uh, agricultural goods uh, to the uh, uh, to the United States. So our main competitors are M Mexican, or uh, Japanese, or Chinese. But Chinese uh, and Japanese firms uh, will have to pay tariffs. For example. Uh, to the uh, Colorado, there is a sport authority uh, which uh, headquartered in uh, Colorado. They're importing a lot of uh, sports goods, sporting goods and garments from China as well as Korea. Now you see the women's and girls knit blouses and shirts and those goods have especially high tariffs, more or less 10%. So, if you uh, buy $10 of goods, uh, they, uh, when they import from China, they will, it will be more than $11 because there will be tax on tax. So uh, if you add uh, taxes on the tariffs, it will be more than $11. But now if you buy Korean goods, it's only $10. So, if there are $12 and $10, Korean goods will have competitiveness. People will buy more Korean goods. That is the one benefit of um, this FTA. And there are another. Um, there, there is a specific term, rules of origin. The goods, um, people may think, people are wise, clever they may think importing some cheap uh, textile goods from China and then export to the United States. The Korean people, Korean uh, textile people can do it. Then and ask United States have no tariffs because it's from Korea. We cannot allow this. So it's only made in Korea. But there are certain percentages that will bring, because so many Korean textile companies invested in China and now exporting to other countries, it will bring those com companies to Korea or United States. So there will be another effect of this FTA to uh, more I say, aligned business in one, one industry because of this FTA. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir. Is it a uh, common perception in North Korea, or is there a paranoia in North Korea that the United States is intent on interfering in the succession from Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un? 
let me address that. You know, that's a, it's an issue that's come up over the years, and, and you know, even as I dealt with North Korea over the last 16, 17 years, uh, you know, I, I tended not to believe that, but there's a couple things that have occurred that suggest that's probably very true. Uh, I recall when we were um, uh, responding to the North Koreans' pullout of the NPT in uh, 2003, and they had begun to reprocess the spent fuel that I talked about to create plutonium. Uh, you know, when I talked to the North Koreans uh, in early 2003, uh, their answer was, well, you know, this is a technical issue. Uh, the spent fuel canisters that the Department of Energy had built for this, they're leaking, we need to pull them out, and I said, that's all nonsense. There's no scientific basis for that. Uh, on the 19th of March, 2003, two very important things occurred. Uh, the first was my daughter-in-law's birthday, but that doesn't <laughs> concern you. Uh, the other was our invasion of Iraq. And shortly following that, the North Koreans called me back up to New York and said, you know, you remember that rationale that we told you about? And they said, no, we, we've, we're changing our mind, you know. And why we are doing this is to create a deterrent. Uh, we believe that if you don't have a deterrent, as the Iraqis did not in terms of weapons of mass destruction, you will invade them. You know, for us, this is a matter of survival. This is why we're going to do that. Now, whether they truly believe that or not, but there are other anecdotal evidences of Kim Jong-il uh, of, you know, all of a sudden he's disappeared from sight, corresponding with some military action the United States has taken on a worldwide basis. So whether or not they've made a calculation that says yes or no, they have periodically acted as though they are concerned about uh, U.S. military uh, intervention. We have time for one more question, if there is one. Yes. The question is, North Korea and China have a long-term relationship. Is there any indicator, are there any indicators at this point that uh, this relationship might change now that we have a political succession underway in uh, North Korea? And if there is a change, what other countries might take the place of China as the primary ally? Yeah. Well, the answer is no, there's not going to be a change. The, uh, the Korea-North uh, North Korea-China relationship uh, is important to both of them, but it's fascinating to take a look and talk with key Chinese officials. The relationship in China with North Korea is based on, on several different channels, uh, one of which is through the, 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 the Communist Party and the Korean Workers' Party. That's pretty close. Uh, the other is military to military. But when you get into the governmental, the foreign ministry connections with the governmental foreign ministry of North Korea, there's no love lost there. You know, there, there are plenty of times in which we would suggest to the North Koreans, well, let's go meet in, in, in Beijing, and they said, nah, we don't want to do that. You know, we want to go meet someplace else. Uh, there are times when the Chinese are just exasperated uh, with the North Koreans, but because of each of their national security interests, the Chinese absolutely want to see uh, a North Korea that remains. It is necessary for them. It is part of their economic development. It is part of their own national security. And while they may not like the misbehavior of the North Koreans, as I mentioned earlier, they are not going to do anything that tips the scales that would lead to uh, the dissolution of uh, North Korea as a country. I, I thought I saw one more hand here. If the, uh, this will be our last question. Peter? If there is uh, Korean unification in the foreseeable future, let's say, uh, what effect do you think that will have on the U.S. remaining uh, predominant power in East Asia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I got it. Okay. Uh, the predictions in terms of reunification have gone on for a long time, but I, I will tell you, with the transition to this 28-year-old, um, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that the North Korea, in a good way, will not survive. 
uh, and that you will see reunification certainly within your lifetime. And what does that mean in terms of the U.S.-Korea uh, allied relationship and the U.S. position in Asia in terms of where its alliances uh, stay? That, you know, honestly will depend on what the unified Korea wants to do and to see at that time. But if you assume that we have the same type of positive relationship that we have today, I would, I would say, suggest that regardless of what the mili U.S. military presence is on the peninsula, that our alliance relationship will be uh, very strong, maybe in other areas than what we've seen uh, today. But that is an evolution that's going to come over a number of years, even after unification. So there's, there'll be no sudden change, but I, I, I would not predict the United States then turning and saying, uh, okay, Mongolia is our next ally, and you know, that's, I don't think that's going to happen. Please join me in thanking Mr. Lim and Ambassador Christopher.